aprobamos la interpretación en español. No lo tengo. No, no lo tengo. En español. Español. Ahora sí. Ahora sí. Gracias. Muy buenas tardes a todos y todas. Un saludo muy especial, reconociendo la petición de la sociedad civil para eh, la celebración de esta audiencia a la ilustre representación del Estado de Canadá por acompañarnos en esta eh, sesión. Eh, damos inicio a la audiencia número 14 de nuestro 188 periodo de sesiones ordinarios de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. Eh, para desarrollar este acto de audiencia que eh, identificamos con el título de los derechos humanos de residentes deportados por motivos penales en Canadá. Eh, esta audiencia ha sido solicitada por las organizaciones Altman Asociados Instituto Internacional de Derechos Humanos y Responsabilidad Social. Eh, quisiera expresar nuestro agradecimiento a mis colegas, compañeros. Me acompañan hoy el comisionado José Luis Caballero, que tiene la relatoría de país. Eh, perdón, la, la relatoría de movilidad humana. Y me acompaña también en esta oportunidad el secretario ejecutivo adjunto en materia de peticiones y casos, Jorge Mesa. Gracias por estar con, eh, en, esta, en esta audiencia. Eh, soy Esmeralda Arosemena de Troitiño. Tengo la primera vicepresidencia de la Comisión Interamericana tengo a mi cargo dos relatorías, la Relatoría de los Derechos de los Pueblos Indígenas y la Relatoría de los Derechos de la Niñez. Eh, en esta oportunidad quisiera plantearles, eh, si no, aunque fuera conocido por algunos, la distribución del tiempo para el desarrollo de esta audiencia. Son 20 minutos para sociedad civil que se lo distribuyen de acuerdo a cómo han organizado su participación, y 20 minutos para el Estado. Tengo además el, la oportunidad de la Comisión de tener algunas preguntas y algunas consideraciones por 20 minutos para la Comisión, y luego como comentarios finales o réplica le damos 12 minutos para eh, sus comentarios finales al Estado y a la, a la sociedad civil. ¿Cuál es el propósito y el objetivo de esta, de esta audiencia? Para la Comisión eh, es eh, poder tener la información correspondiente sobre este abordaje de la falta de proporcionalidad que sobre los planes de inadmisibilidad penal en Canadá y su esquema para la deportación se, se usa, de manera que eh, eh, es utilizado para eh, remover a personas residentes que tienen permanencias de largo plazo y que por las fórmulas utilizadas son encontrados inadmisibles por criminalidad esto en violación a los derechos, entre otros, 
a la igualdad ante la ley, las garantías judiciales, la protección a la honra, la dignidad, la reputación personal, la vida privada y familiar, derechos que están establecidos en la Declaración Americana de los Derechos y Deberes del Hombre. Como les indicaba la distribución del tiempo, entonces voy a darle de inmediato la palabra a los representantes de las organizaciones de la organización civil, indicándoles que por favor hagan el, 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 la identificación de sus nombres como participantes y de la organización que representan a fines de registrar eh, para, para nuestros controles, ¿no? para el registro. Muchas gracias y le paso la palabra. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm speaking on behalf of Waldman and Associates, uh, Isarod, Claire, and the uh, six other listed delegates. I also thank Canada for its participation here. I would like to explain how a lacuna in Canada's immigration law, which authorizes the deportation of long-term permanent residents and de facto citizens without a proper proportionality assessment, violates international norms governing proportionate and humane treatment. I will speak first uh, for about 10 minutes, followed by my colleague to the right. The problem stems from Canada's categorical approach to inadmissibility, whereby non-citizens found inadmissible on account of serious criminality receiving and receive sentences of six months or more, or inadmissible for organized criminality or security concerns are mechanically issued removal orders without a requirement for a proportionality assessment that balances the severity of the inadmissibility against the individual's personal circumstances, including their ties to the country and um, their degree of dangerousness. While we acknowledge that Canada, like any country, may expel citizens who break the law, we nevertheless maintain that this power ought to be exercised in a rational and proportionate manner that balances the benefit to the state in terms of safeguarding public safety against harms to the individual flowing from an expulsion that may occur following decades of permanent residence in Canada. As it is presently constituted, our submission is that Canada's law is deficient. I'll begin with a brief overview of the admissibility adjudication scheme in Canada, and then I will turn to a couple of case studies that we believe are illustrative of the problem. So some background on the admissibility system. Canadian legislation establishes categorical standards governing the expulsion of non-citizens found to have engaged in criminal activity. Notably, Section 36, serious criminality, and Section 37, organized criminality. Regarding the former, if the permanent resident is convicted, and this is irrespective of how long they've been in the country, of any criminal offense for which the maximum sentence is 10 years, and he or she is given a six months or greater carceral sentence, there is no requirement for an assessment of the permanent resident's personal circumstances prior to removal from Canada. In the case of organized criminality, the bar against any proportionality assessment is absolute. I will explain the deportation process as it has two stages. First, at the investigation, investigative stage, law enforcement writes up the permanent resident under the relevant admissibility provision, whether it's serious criminality or organized criminality, for, exa for example. And then the officer forwards the allegation to an immigration judge for adjudication. As the Court of Appeal has affirmed, investigators have no obligation to consider the personal circumstances when they are deciding whether to proceed against an individual at this uh, investigative and referral stage. At the second stage, the immigration judge determines whether the admissibility allegation has been proven on a balance of probabilities. In serious criminality cases, the adjudication stage is reduced to a mere formality. The prosecutor need only demonstrate that the personal person concerned was convicted of an offense uh, with a 10-year or greater maximum, irrespective of the actual sentence imposed. The judge has no equitable jurisdiction and must issue a removal order if the allegation is made out. The Court of Appeal has recently held that, uh, uh, or the Court of Appeal has held that constitutional norms against grossly disproportionate treatment are not engaged at this uh, admissibility adjudication stage. While recourse to an equitable appeal at the appeal board is possible in certain instances, organized criminality and security cases are categorically unappealable. Uh, that's, they, there's no way to get humanitarian relief from the appeal board. 
And importantly, this is also the case with serious criminality cases for which a six-month sentence has been imposed. Thus, for a permanent resident who has, for example, received a six-month sentence for drug possession, issuance of a removal order is an inevitable mechanical consequences of the statutory machinery. And there's no requirement that there be any proportionality assessment prior to the execution of the deportation order, irrespective of duration of time spent in Canada, family ties, evidence of rehabilitation, relative risk of reoffending, and prejudice to affected children. Well, there is a what's called a pre-removal risk assessment stage. This is a, a kind of defense of a, asylum claim, and it's available uh, before removal. The assessment here considers only harms that would befall the individual in the country of removal. It cannot entertain harms flowing from family, family separation, emotional distress, or the deportee's inability to access health care following deportation. Although Canada's constitution enshrines norms against grossly disproportionate state action under uh, section 7 and 12 of our charter, judicial interpretation has rendered recourse to such provisions largely unavailable for long-term permanent residents. The courts have determined that deportation of persons who has committed criminal offenses is not uh, grossly disproportionate, and that's in the Ravel case at the Court of Appeal. The only process that may be available to a long-term permanent resident facing deportation for serious criminality is an application to reobtain permanent residence on humanitarian grounds. However, said application process takes several years and the courts have determined that the existence of the application is not a valid basis to delay deportation. There is no automatic stay of removal and moreover, um, those who are deemed inadmissible of organized criminality in cases, for example, where it can be said that three or more people were involved in the crime, they are barred from uh, submitting humanitarian and compassionate application altogether. Therefore, the effect of the legislative scheme is that long-term permanent residents who have committed crimes receiving a six-month or more sentence will in most cases be deported without any assessment as to whether the deportation is disproportionate to the risk the person poses to the society, given his or her conduct. I will now turn to a couple of case studies which uh, highlight these issues. Uh, the first study, Mr. Kuhner, uh, who was in 1992, he arrived at the age of 14 to Canada from India. He set down roots, he got married and had children. He started using opioids to cope with severe migraines and this evolved into an addiction. In around 2012, he was caught selling drugs to an undercover officer in an attempt to finance his habit. As a result, he was convicted in 2017 of three counts of possession for the purposes of trafficking and was given a three-year sentence. In June 2018, while in prison, an immigration judge found him inadmissible for serious criminality and issued a removal order. In prison, he received methadone maintenance therapy, which enabled him to manage his addiction. He also submitted an application for permanent residence on humanitarian grounds, in which he advanced his successful efforts in addressing his addiction and rehabilitation. However, after serving two years in prison, he was permitted uh, to serve the final year of his sentence in the community. One of the key factors raised in Mr. Kuhner's case in his humanitarian application was that the methadone treatment he relied on to control his addiction was uh, very difficult to obtain in the Punjab part of India to which he would be removed. Had he been deported, he would have been deprived of this important treatment, exposing him to severe consequences, which undoubtedly would have undermined his recovery process and exposed him to risk. In July 2021, despite the fact that his humanitarian application had been pending for some three years, Canada scheduled Mr. Kuhner for deportation in August 2021, even though there had been no assessment to, as to whether deportation was grossly disproportionate. After deportation was scheduled, Mr. Kuhner applied for relief for the UN, from the UN Human Rights Committee, which issued interim measures that prevented deportation. Otherwise, he very likely would have been removed, even though no de de um, determination was made as to the proportionality. Ultimately, in early 2022, an immigration officer concluded that the circumstances of the case were such that he should not, uh, that he should receive permanent residence on humanitarian grounds. But had it not been for the UN's intervention, Mr. Kuhner would have already have been removed without any proportionality assessment, despite his lengthy history in Canada, his extensive family ties, and despite the fact that the medical treatment that he uh, needed for well-being was difficult to obtain. In terms of the question of proportionality in the case of Mr. Kuhner, there was no evidence he posed any risk to Canadian society. His conviction was related, related to his addiction, which he was able to control on methadone. In essence, the system treated him as an abstract, uh, abstract source of danger and didn't look into the personalized situation. <laughs> 
Mr. Ravel is our second case study for which we've uh, received permission from, from the individuals to share. Born in the United Kingdom, Mr. Ravel arrived in Canada with his family at age 10. His, fire, his entire family, including children and grandchildren, are here. In 2008, he was convicted of possession of cocaine and possession for the purposes of trafficking. The Im immigration authorities considered removal at that time, but opted not to proceed. In 2013, Mr. Ravel pleaded guilty to assault with a weapon, uh, being a TV remote, and a, a assault causing bodily harm owing to a domestic situation with his then girlfriend. He pleaded guilty and received a suspended sentence, no jail time, which prompted the authorities to revisit um, their decision to, to overlook the 2008 convictions. Following an admissibility hearing, an immigration judge ruled him inadmissible for criminality and organized criminality, given that more than two people were involved, and ordered him deported. The immigration judge was not persuaded by his uh, constitutional arguments that the admissibility scheme violates charter protections against grossly disproportionate state action. This decision was upheld by both the federal court and the federal court of appeal. In June 2020, the immigration, uh, the CBSA, which is our enforcement apparatus, immigration enforcement apparatus, sought removal of Mr. Ravel. However, the federal court stated the removal in view of COVID-related considerations. Ultimately, however, Mr. Ravel was deported from Canada in early 2022. Unlike in Mr. Kuhner's case, the UN did not intervene. It's been almost two years since his deportation to a country with which he has had a very limited connection over his many years in Canada. Uh, he's been separated from his children, grandchildren, and siblings who are all in Canada. And this has happened without any proportionality assessment that considered evidence that he had completely disassociated himself from his past associates, turned his life around, was at a very low risk to reoffend, as the evidence dis disclosed, and had little connection to the UK. He had visited that country only once since his boyhood relocation to Canada. With that, I'm going to turn my, to my colleague for the balance of our, our presentation. Thank you. My name is Juan Ignacio Rodriguez, and I speak on behalf of the International Institute of Social Responsibility and Human Rights. Commissioners, members of the commission, and state authorities. I will now discuss the legal standards and principles that are being violated by Canada's inadmissibility system and by the expulsion of non-citizens who have engaged in criminal activity. I will first address the issue of discriminatory measures against long-term permanent residents, and second, I will discuss the issue of the lack of proportionality in the deportation against them. I will also address how these violations affect the right to a fair trial and due process, the right to security of the person, their dignity, the right to family life, and the right to private life. The principle of non-discrimination is a cornerstone, cornerstone of human rights law. It is included in every international human rights instrument. This is also enshrined in the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man, which was signed by Canada. When justice discriminates, it ceases to be justice. However, Canada's regime of deportation of long-term permanent residents discriminates based on the person's non-citizen status, denying them the right to a fair trial by not allowing a proportionality assessment of their deportation. It must be clear that we are not here to excuse criminality, but to seek justice where the punishment does not fit the crime and where the sentence is alive in exile from one's home and from one's family. As stated before by my colleague, Canada restricts the rights of long-term permanent residents. According to the Court of Appeals, investigators have no obligation to consider the personal circumstances when deciding whether, whether to proceed against an individual. Also, prosecutors need only demonstrate that the person concerned was convicted of an offense with a 10-year po possible sentence. The actual sentence must not be taken into consideration. Constitutional norms against grossly di disproportionate treatment are not engaged at the admissibility adjudication stage. Also, cases of organized criminality and security are categorically unappealable. This is a clear discrimination based on nationality, as these restrictions on the right to a fair trial and to legal recourse are only faced by non-citizens. The persons affected by Canada's regime are not just non-citizens, 
they are long-term permanent residents who have already attained legal status in the country and who should enjoy the same rights as any Canadian citizen. By treating them as abstr abstract threats, Canada's policy dehumanizes individuals and strips them of their inherent dignity. It is also worth mentioning that the intersection of criminality with issues of race and immigration status creates a discriminatory impact on long-term permanent residents who belong to minority groups, further entrenching systemic inequities. Now, regarding proportionality, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights stated in its advisory opinion regarding the juridical condition and rights of undocumented migrants that persons who face deportation need the guaranteed opportunity to illustrate that their connection to the country outweighs their alleged threat to public order. Canada's courts, however, are of the opinion that deportation of non-citizens who have committed criminal offenses cannot be considered grossly disproportionate. The cases of Mr. Kuhner and Mr. Rivell represent clear evidence on the contrary. This commission, as well as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the UN Human Rights Committee have emphasized that proportionality is a necessary element in the context of deportation. An infringement to, the hum to human rights can only be justified if there is a pressing need to protect public order and that the infringement is proportionate and necessary to the state's objectives. However, state's interest in maintaining public order can be overridden by an individual's connection with the country of residence. These considerations are counterbalanced by the state's interest in maintaining public or order, the seriousness of the individual's criminal activity, and the length of time since the last criminal offense. Canada's deportation scheme considers none of these factors. It fails to appraise uh, at long-term permanent residents' real risk to public safety or public order. The IRPA authorizes deportation on criminality grounds for an overly broad, broad class of individuals. There is also a wide range of seriousness. For example, organized criminality under Section 37 can include a relatively low level of participation in a series of more minor offenses, such as shoplifting, or it can also be based on events that took place many years earlier when the person was in their youth. The burden of proof for admissibility is lower than the regular legal standard in Canada. All that is required are reasonable grounds to believe that an individual committed an act or was a member of a group that, could, that committed an act that is prescribed by law. Thus, IRPA captures broad classes of persons whose offenses do not reach the level of particularly serious crimes and are thus not indicators of risk to public safety. Furthermore, the process does not consider whether the person is unlikely to reoffend or whether the sentence is initially more severe, given variations in sentencing patterns across jurisdictions. In an important number of cases, long-term permanent residents are persons who arrive to Canada at a young age and have now spent the majority of their life in the country. They have almost no connection with their country of origin in some cases, and in almost all cases, they have already built a life in Canada. This is ignored by the criminal admiss inadmissibility scheme. A policy that inflicts trauma indiscriminately cannot be considered a tool of justice. Again, we are not looking for persons to have immunity from prosecution. We are denouncing the lack of fairness and proportionality and we're asking Canada to uphold the basic human rights star standards it has pledged to protect. Finally, states have a duty to properly examine the extent of the hardship that the persons would experience if returned to, to their country of origin. The disproportionate de deportation threatens the mental integrity of long-term permanent residents, which in some cases could amount to cruel, in inhuman, or degrading treatment. The process of deportation exposes them to psychological harm as reintegration to their host countries is not easy. 
and they may even experience social alienation. Also, long-term permanent residents may have family members who are also long-term permanent residents or who are even Canadian citizens. And therefore, as only the, the one who committed the crime is deported, their families are separated with no justifi justifiable reason. Commissioners, I end my presentation with this thought. Society is judged not by how it treats its most privileged citizens, but by how it treats those who have erred, repented, and seek to live a life of dignity. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, vamos a darle de inmediato la palabra a la representación del Estado. Good afternoon, commissioners, Madam Chairman, uh, observers, members of the Secretariat, and of course to civil society representatives across. Uh, I compliment you all for being here today, and I think what I hope is our shared commitment to uh, more just and uh, livable uh, Americas, including Canada. Uh, my name is Stuart Savage. I am Canada's permanent representative to the Organization of American States, not a legal expert. So what I'm leading, reading today is provided by our experts back in Ottawa. And uh, I hope I can respect the time limit you've given us. I will try to read quickly. Uh, regardless, we will submit this in writing so that you will have the full presentation. Uh, one important point, though, is to note that Canada is a strong supporter of the Inter-American Human Rights System. The Inter-American Commission on Human Rights plays a critically important role within that system and in promoting and protecting human rights in the Americas, and Canada salutes and supports that. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to reiterate Canada's commitment to and engagement with the vital institution that is the Commission, and thank you for the opportunity today to respond to the civil society's uh, comments on our uh, immigration system. Uh, uh, in particular, I would like to begin with my comments by stating that the Government of Canada's legislative framework pertaining to inadmissibility is intended to protect public health and safety and to maintain the security of Canadian society while also establishing a robust, comprehensive system to protect human rights of non-citizens. Canada is a staunch defender of human rights, and is, uh, both at home and abroad, and our immigration and refugee system has multiple safeguards to protect human rights of non-citizens. I, I will be referring throughout my presentation to Canada's Immigration Refugee Protection Act, the IRPA, uh, which was also referred to in uh, the other presentation, or IRPA, a lot of us use the, the uh, short form IRPA. The IRPA, is the primary federal legislation regulating immigration to Canada. The ERPA specifically defines the grounds for inadmissibility, according to which a foreign national and, in some scenarios, a permanent resident can be found inadmissible to Canada and therefore potentially subject to removal. These grounds are narrowly defined and are applied in a manner that is procedurally fair. The person affected receives fair notice of the grounds for their potential inadmissibility. Then they have the opportunity to participate in a decision-making process by making written submissions. All inadmissibility decisions are subject to judicial review for their reasonableness and fairness. In some cases, permanent residents inadmissible on the grounds of serious criminality may also appeal a decision to make a removal order against them to the Immigration Appeal Division of the Immigration and Refugee Board of Canada. Persons who have been found inadmissible to Canada can avail themselves of a number of mechanisms to bring their particular circumstances to the attention of authorities. Most importantly, from the perspective of international human rights law, the IRPA protects against refoulement. Canadian law affords all inadmissible non-citizens with only a few rare and specific exceptions an opportunity to establish whether their removal will result in a danger of torture, risk to life, or risk of cruel and unusual punishment. This assessment involves a procedurally fair and individualized evaluation of risk based on the individual's circumstances 
and the circumstances in the country where the removal is being contemplated. All decisions in the immigration process, including inadmissibility and risk assessments, are subject to judicial review, including for their consistency with the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Supreme Court of Canada has long held that it is constitutional for non-Canadians, including permanent residents, long-term or otherwise, to be subject to immigration enforcement measures and possibly removal if they are found inadmissible. This has included consideration of whether removal is contrary to Section 12 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which prohibits cruel and unusual treatment or punishment, as well as Section 7, which guarantees the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, including against any grossly disproportionate deprivations of those rights. In 2019, the Federal Court of Appeal reaffirmed that it is constitutional for a long-term permanent resident to be subject to loss of their immigration status and removal from Canada. I would now like to take a moment to explain in greater detail the grounds for inadmissibility, the process for finding a person inadmissible, and the mechanisms that can potentially benefit persons who have been found inadmissible. Foreign nationals or permanent residents found inadmissible to Canada for serious reasons do not have access to humanitarian and compassionate relief due to the sev severity of the inadmissibilities. These reasons are set out in sections 34, 35, 35.1, and 37 of the IRPA. Permit me to expand on these. Section 34 refers to security reasons including espionage, subversion, such as attempts to overthrow a government, violence or terrorism, or <coughs> members of an organization involved in any of these activities. Section 35 addresses human rights or international rights violations, including war crimes, crimes against humanities, or being a senior official in a government engaged in gross human rights violations or subject to international sanctions. Sections 35.1 addresses sanctions, including foreign nationals named in an order or a regulation made under the Special Economic Measures Act or the Justice for Victims of Corrupt Foreign Officials Act, as well as persons subject to sanctions, including travel bans imposed by an association of countries of which Canada is a member. For greater clarity, sanctions and admissibility do not apply to permanent residents. Section 37 addresses organized criminality, including membership in an organization that takes part in organized criminal activity, people smuggling, or money laundering. Note that permanent residents and former nationals who are trafficked or smuggled into Canada with the assistance of organized criminal uh, networks are not inadmissible on the grounds of organized criminality. Another related serious inadmissibility is set out in Section 36 of the IRPA. This inadmissibility, however, does not prevent access to humanitarian and compassionate relief. Section 36, brackets 1, addresses cases of serious criminality. A permanent resident or foreign national is inadmissible on the grounds of serious criminality if the person has been convicted in Canada of an offence under an Act of Parliament punishable by a maximum term of imprisonment of at least 10 years, or of an offence under an Act of Parliament for which a term of imprisonment of more than six months has been imposed, or the person is convicted of or has committed a crime outside of Canada that would have a possible sentence of 10 or more years of imprisonment if it had been committed in Canada. I would now like to take a moment to explain the process for determining inadmissibility. This process, specifically for serious inadmissibilities uh, described above, is lengthy, independent, and subject to a variety of safety valves. These safety valves in the ERPA provide a genuine opportunity for each individual's circumstances to be considered. Depending upon whether the individual is already in Canada, the process begins at, with an examination at the border or if they're already in Canada, an investigation. 
an allegation of inadmissibility is then made under Section 44 of the ERPA. This allegation is reviewed by a minister's delegate who is a specifically trained officer that can refer the allegation to the Independent Immigration Division at the Immigration and Refugee Board for determination. At each stage of the inadmissibility determination process, applicants are notified of the reasons for which they are alleged to be inadmissible and are given an opportunity to make written submissions in response to allegations. They may also retain legal counsel to assist them in the preparation of their submissions and represent them at the admissibility hearing. Immigra the Immigration Division will review the facts submitted by both sides and determine whether or not a person is inadmissible to Canada and issue a removal order if appropriate. Each decision, that is the allegations of inadmissibility, the referral by the minister's delegate, and the inadmissibility finding by the Immigration Division, can be submitted to us separately, separately for judicial review, where the federal court can review each decision for procedural fairness, reasonableness, and compliance with Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. As I mentioned earlier, persons who have been found inadmissible can potentially benefit from a number of mechanisms to avoid removal from Canada. In some cases, these may allow individuals to gain relief from the inadmissibility determination itself. While the availability of mechanisms to avoid removal narrows in a manner consistent with the severity of the grounds of inadmissibility, at no point is the availability of mechanisms provided by the ERPA reduced to zero. At no point is it reduced to zero. Generally, the more serious the ground of inadmissibility, the fewer discretionary remedies are available. The first of these is a judicial review of inadmissibility determinations. Just as each step in an inadmissibility process can be submitted to judicial review, so can the inadmissibility determination itself. The federal court and the federal court of appeal can both be asked to review the decision. The second is a temporary resident permit. Under section 24 of the ERPA, a foreign national who is, admit, who is inadmissible to Canada may be issued a temporary resident permit to overcome an inadmissibility to Canada if the officer of the, is of the opinion that it is justified. This is de te a temporary facilitation mechanism and officers have discretionary authority entrusted by legislation to issue such a permit. The permit can be canceled at any time. The next, me next mechanism I would like to highlight falls under section 25.2 bracket one of the ERPA, which specifies the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship may grant an exemption from any applicable criteria or obligation of the ERPA if the foreign national complies with any conditions imposed by the minister and the minister is of the opinion that it is justified by public policy considerations. This public policy authority may be used to grant permanent residence status to individual inadmissibilities, in, in, pardon me, may be granted permanent, uh, sorry, let me start again. The public policy authority may be used to grant permanent resident status to individuals inadmissible on any ground, including serious inadmissibilities. Humanitarian and compassionate grounds uh, are at the discretion of authorities entrusted un under the ERPA to the Minister of Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. The Minister can grant exemptions or permanent residence in exceptional circumstances and or cases not uh, anticipated by the legislation. A humanitarian and compassionate request may be made by any applicant for permanent residence, section 0.25, or an, on initiative of the Minister, section 25.1, except where the foreign national is inadmissible under sections 34, 35, 31.1, or 37, those I mentioned earlier, of the ERPA. This authority would apply in cases where the minister is of the opinion that granting such an exemption or status is justified by humanitarian and compassionate considerations, taking into account the best interests, for example, of children that may be directly affected. Common factors that may be part of the minister's assessment include 
the applicant's establishment in Canada, the physical and mental health impacts of uh, the removal on the individual, the impact of their removal on family members, and any other factors that might warrant allowing them to remain in Canada despite being inadmissible. This safety valve is not available to persons inadmissible under sections 34, 35, 35.1, and 37 of the IRPA due to the nature and seriousness of the acts committed by the person found inadmissible on those grounds. The great majority of inadmissibility, inadmissible persons who are ineligible for humanitarian and compassionate consideration may apply for ministerial relief under section 42.1 of the IRPA. This section permits the Minister of Public Safety to declare that a person is no longer inadmissible if they testify and satisfy the Minister that to do so would not be contrary to the national interest. It should be noted that only a very narrow subset of inadmissible persons are ineligible for both humanitarian and compassionate consideration and ministerial relief. These are individuals who have been found to have engaged in conduct that is the international community almost unanimous, unanimously condemns consistent with international law. This would consist of individuals found to have actually committed an act outside of Canada that consists, constitutes a war crime, genocide, or a crime against humanity, or those whose entry into or stay in Canada is restricted by sanctions, whether from an international organization or domestic law. However, pursuant to the discretionary public policy authority of the Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship, an exemption for such inadmissibility or even permanent resident status could be granted to such foreign nationals if the foreign national complies with any conditions imposed by the minister and if the minister is of the opinion that it is justified by public policy considerations. As noted above, no matter the reason for inadmissibility, all NATO citizens facing removal from Canada have access to several mechanisms for a fair and individualized assessment of foreseeable risk in order to prevent refoulement contrary to international law. This is in mind, with this in mind, I would like to take a moment to discuss the abil ab ability of individuals to seek a pre-removal risk assessment, or PRRA, pre-removal risk assessment. The Canada Border Service Agency, which implements the IRPA at the border, or CBSA, has a, a statutory obligation to remove individuals subject to enforcement removal orders as soon as possible. However, prior to removal, eligible individuals may apply to the Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada for a pre-removal as risk assessment, also known as a PRRA. This PRRA is designed to assess the potential risk associated with returning their, this individual to their country of origin or habitual residence. During the removal interview, the removal officer will determine if any practical impediments to removal exist, such as a lack of valid travel documents. The officer will attempt to resolve most of these impediments prior to inviting the individual to apply for a PRRA. Once the officer determines that the removal can proceed, the individual is invited to submit a PRRA application. If the individual chooses to do so and submits the application within the prescribed timeline, the application will serve as a stay of removal until a decision is made on the PRRA application. If a person is found to be at risk of prosecution, torture, risk to life, or cruel or unusual punishment, the removal will be cancelled and the person will, in most cases, be granted protected person status and have an opportunity to apply for permanent residency in Canada. Persons who are inadmissible on serious grounds, for example, serious criminality, security violations of human rights or organized crime, will receive a restricted assessment. In other words, the PRRA will assess the risk of torture and the risk of life or cruel and unusual treatment and punishment. The assessment does not assess the risk of prosecution in case of a positive decision with uh, restricted assessment, the individual would not be granted protected status 
but would benefit from a stay of removal until circumstances change in their source country and can be safely removed. If the person is not found to be at risk, the CBSA would begin removal arrangements such as obtaining travel documents and making flight arrangements. Uh, with your permission, I think I have about two minutes worth of text left, so I will try to roll, roll through. I would now like to turn to the removal process and explain measures to allow the possible deferral of removals. When scheduling a departure date, removals officers will allow sufficient time for individuals to organize their personal affairs prior to removal. Removal officers can also temporarily defer removal where failure to do so will expose the individual to a risk of death, extreme sanctions, or inhumane treatment. Removal may also be deferred in other exceptional circumstances brought forward by the individual. Examples could include the short-term best interest of the child, the individual being removed being medically unfit for travel, etc. The discretion a removal officer may exercise in such cases is very limited and is restricted to when a removal order would be executed rather than whether the individual would be removed. It should be noted that a removal order officer cannot defer a removal indefinitely. If a temporary deferral or removal is granted by the removal officer, the removal will be postponed temporarily. Conversely, if the removal officer denies the request, the removal will proceed. When an individual's request for a deferral is denied, they are able to apply to a federal court of Canada for a judicial review of that decision. They can also simultaneously submit a stay motion to suspend the removal order for a period of time. If the federal court grants the stay motion, the scheduled removal will be cancelled. In concluding, I'd like to say the, to reiterate Canada's legislative and operational framework for immigration, including an inadmissibility and removals, is consistent with Canada's obligations under international human rights laws, including the norms of the inter-American system. As is well established, removal of a foreign national does not in and of itself amount to torture or cruel, inhumane, or degrading treatment or punishment. International human rights law prohibits the removal of foreign nationals where it would expose them to certain risks. In particular, the risk of death, torture, or other irreparable harm. International law also generally requires legality and fairness in the removal process and access to effective remedies. As illustrated in my preceding comments, Canada's system fulfills these requirements, including in relation to persons found inadmissible on serious grounds. Canada has established a fair process for decision-making on inadmissibility with numerous processes available to those who have been found inadmissible and fair procedures for individualized risk assessment for those facing removal. All of these processes are subject to judicial review. A decision to remove an individual from Canada is not taken lightly. Every individual facing removal is entitled to due process, but once all revenues have been exhausted, an individual may be removed from Canada in accordance with Canadian law. That may reiterate that Canada make, takes its human rights obligations seriously and is committed to maintaining a constructive dialogue with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a vital aspect of a strong and effective international human rights system. I thank you for this opportunity today. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, vamos ahora a la segunda parte para la participación de los comisionados y de la Secretaría Técnica. Eh, yo quisiera eh, partir de el, la complejidad del de el, el conjunto de, la, de las normas eh, y me parece que hay hoy En, en, esta, en este planteamiento, dos posiciones muy confrontadas, ¿verdad? Eh, la situación muy particular de unas personas que tienen permanencia de larga estancia que no alcanzan a tener un mecanismo de apelación o de fórmula para buscar eh, una, por lo menos la revisión de, de, esa, de esa respuesta. Creo que esa es la posición de la sociedad civil. El Estado plantea que hay una posición eh, eh, en, en la materia regular, regulatoria, 
en las normas y que eh, siempre habrá una oportunidad de, 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 no quiero usar la palabra apelación, porque no se trata del recurso de apelación, sino mecanismos, diferentes mecanismos para atender eh, una, una petición en estas circunstancias muy particular. Aquí la sociedad también ha señalado, no es eh, eh, el, el tema de, de inmunidad, de, de no juzgamiento, sino de la, la, la necesidad de un procedimiento que permita a la parte eh, una, una opinión. Un, decimos en recurso una posibilidad de recurrir. Entonces, como hay estas dos posiciones, eh, eh, al final pues, de nuestra intervención sí nos gustaría tener entonces los comentarios eh, de, de, de ambas partes. ¿no? Y voy en, entonces a darle la palabra al comisionado eh, eh, José Luis para eh, en su calidad de relator de eh, la Relatoría en Movilidad Humana, porque esto implica precisamente este, esta concepción de lo que la situación de movilidad humana puede con, eh, mantener en un, en un caso en particular una situación muy particular planteada por la sociedad civil. Comisionado. Muy buenas tardes, tengan, tengan hoy. Eh, saludo a la presidenta Esmeralda Rosemena de Trutiño, mi colega comisionada, al secretario ejecutivo adjunto de peticiones y casos, Jorge Mesa. Un saludo a las personas que nos acompañan de la sociedad civil y al Estado. Muchas gracias por, por por sus destacadas, además, intervenciones en este sentido de claridad y de puntualidad en lo que está pasando. Un tema complejo, como dijo la comisionada. Y yo quería, quiero, quiero traer la atención brevemente en, en, un, en una cuestión muy importante. Me, me parece que el Estado, de una manera muy solvente, muy clara, destacó el tema de la legislación de Canadá y destacó de forma vigorosa, digamos, los puntos de debido proceso y los puntos de articulación que, como dijo la comisionada Esmeralda, dan cuenta de la posibilidad de ir interactuando en diferentes instancias. Eso me parece que tendríamos ahí, podríamos abrir alguna ruta de, de preguntas, pero me parece que fue muy solvente. Lo que, lo que yo quiero atraer la atención es en el punto... De, de la mirada internacional, es decir, la resolución 419 de los principios interamericanos sobre derechos humanos efectivamente habla del debido proceso. Esta resolución interamericana es sobre todo a las personas migrantes, no solamente refugiadas, no solamente apátridas, sino cualquier persona migrante. Y en ese contexto los principios interamericanos vinculan al Estado de Canadá en relación con su adscripción a la Declaración Americana de Derechos y Deberes al Hombre y también al Sistema Universal a través del Pacto Internacional de Derechos Civiles y Políticos. Entonces, la mirada internacional tiene que ver con algunos principios, no solamente el debido proceso, sino el tema de la larga permanencia. ¿no? En, en la opinión consultiva 25 de la Corte Interamericana solicitada por Ecuador, ha señalado que el principio de no devolución es también, no solamente funciona en temas de, o se debe atender en temas de derecho de asilo, sino como garantía de respeto de los derechos humanos, una medida cuyo fin es preservar la vida, la libertad, la integridad, y más en personas que tienen largo tiempo en el Canadá o en los países en, en, en abstracto. Ese es un punto que yo quería destacar para preguntarle al Estado en el terreno de la no devolución como principio fundamental de los compromisos internacionales, cómo lo estarían viendo. Y el segundo tema que quiero destacar también y que quiero preguntar al Estado es en el tema de la unidad familiar, que ese es un, es un punto importante porque ahí entran en juego derechos de terceras personas muy particularmente de niñas y niños en relación con, 
su padre o su madre que sean, además, que tengan la guardia y custodia, que tengan la patria potestad, como decimos indebidamente, o la responsabilidad parental. Eso, 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 ese es el punto que yo quisiera preguntar, la consideración del Estado. Muchas gracias por su atención. Gracias, comisionado. Eh, secretario, Jorge Mesa, gracias. Muchas gracias, eh, vicepresidente. Igual un saludo para el, el comisionado eh, relator. Eh, realmente las preguntas que ya eh, mencionaron los, los comisionados me parece que abarcan muy bien eh, los aspectos. Yo quisiera solamente eh, algunos detalles pues, por las posiciones que se han eh, señalado acá. En primer lugar, esta situación de inadmisibilidad por criminalidad entendemos que aplica solo a determinado tipo de delitos. Entonces, tal vez eh, precisar o aportar esa, esa información. Y la otra cuestión es si esta falta de análisis de proporcionalidad ocurre en la fase administrativa o ocurre en la fase judicial, porque de lo que señalaba el Estado sí hay una posibilidad de eh, revisar, digamos, de manera más amplia. Entonces, precisar si se trata de una cuestión en la, en la parte administrativa o en la parte eh, judicial, porque pues, de ello dependería mucho también el, el análisis que, que se pudiera eh, realizar. Eh, también preguntar un poco al Estado si dentro del concepto del de, eh, principio de no devolución se entienden algunas otras situaciones, por ejemplo, vinculadas a salud, eh, con el ejemplo que se había señalado, y cómo se evalúa eh, esta cuestión eh, relacionada con los vínculos eh, familiares, que también se, se señaló. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Ah, gracias. Bueno, eh, como, como planteaba en el, 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 inicio, el inicio, la, la posición de, de ambas partes me parece que son de confrontación. No hay un... Eh, eh, no hay un acuerdo en la consideración de que tienen la posibilidad de buscar un mecanismo de respuesta ante la decisión de la deportación y que eh, independiente, eh, basándose en estos elementos de la proporcionalidad, eh, eh, porque hay unas líneas jurídicas que no lo permite. Entonces, yo quisiera que en las respuestas que nos, nos van a, a plantear ambas partes, a, a hacer esa, esa posibilidad de cómo lo ve sociedad civil el planteamiento de eh, la, la aplicación de ver, verdaderos mecanismos, fórmulas o procedimientos en la, con los cuales las personas que ustedes han identificado muy puntualmente, tengan opción de una respuesta. Porque eh, me, me uno al, al tema muy, muy puntual de una valoración del derecho de los niños, también lo dijo el Estado, el interés superior de los niños cuando están siendo, cuando tienen una afectación por, precisamente por esta, por esta decisión de deportación. Ahí sencillamente no hay el mantenimiento de la unidad familiar, el, se rompen los vínculos familiares y, y si eso no tiene ni, en, ningún peso a la hora de una determinación en estos casos que, de acuerdo a la ley, no tendrían opción. Pero entendí, y me disculpan si no lo comprendí bien, que eh, sí hay posibilidades, aún en esos supuestos, aún en esos supuestos de, una, de un tipo de criminalidad. Eh, eso me parece que yo necesitaría una, una, una precisión de, ¿hay alguna opción? o no hay ninguna opción en determinadas circunstancias. Voy a, voy a, vamos a darle primero la palabra a la sociedad civil y luego entonces la participación del Estado para, esta, para, esta, para, para escuchar sus posiciones. Gracias, uh, señora Chair. Y su pregunta es muy bien tomada. I think the best way to address this is by way of a thought experiment, an example. 
So let's consider the situation of a person who uh, was given six months in prison for narcotics possession. That's an offense that carries a maximum sentence of 10 years or greater. That's our threshold for serious criminality. So that means a serious criminality standard is engaged for that person. So, so what happens next? An investigator writes up the individual um, under Section 36 and alleges that they're, they're inadmissible for serious, crimin uh, serious criminality because of their conviction. Well, next, the next step is that, that um, if that report is rational and well-founded, it gets re uh, referred to an immigration judge. Now, it's very important here to consider what that judge's jurisdiction is. That judge's jurisdiction is to determine whether the offense, whether the per, whether they have before them the person in question, whether that offense did carry a sentence of 10 years or more, and that's about it. So my Canada makes a lot about the ability, the, the requirements for procedural fairness and due process and the availability of judicial review. But what is there for the judge to review? The person in our thought experiment has been found guilty they got a sentence of six months. If the immigration judge makes a mistake and, and the facts were that the sentence was five months or that, the, or that it was a petty crime where there is a maximum sentence of less than 10 years, well, then there'd be something for the federal court to review. But when we're dealing with the categorical standards set out in our immigration legislation, the IRPA, there is very little for the courts to do absent certain extraordinary circumstances. So continuing with our thought experiment, this person will be mechanically found to be inadmissible to Canada for serious criminality. They will lose their permanent resident status at, the, at that point by, uh, before the, it, um, the immigration judge. There will be no ability to consider the best interests of the child before the immigration judge or any other personal circumstances, including the individual's length of time in Canada. Once that removal order is issued, it is enforceable. And as Canada has pointed out, the discretion to defer is very narrow and the enforcement apparatus of the state has a mandate to carry out that enforcement promptly. So what else can this person do that's, faced, that's been issued a removal order and the state is knocking on his door saying, we want to execute this order? Well, Canada brought the example of a humanitarian and compassion application. Yes, the person could make a humanitarian compassion application to regain permanent residence, but that is a very lengthy process. It typically takes years. In non-complicated cases, um, Canada on their online system estimates about 22 to 24 months. In serious criminality cases where there's fewer uh, ministers, delegates authorized to consider the circumstances, it may take quite a bit longer. So that person can be removed from Canada while the humanitarian application is in process. So let's, let's imagine that the person is removed in Canada. They're removed to, a uh, to the country that they may have had no connection to for many, many years. And in our two cases that we presented, both people came to Canada as children, uh, but uh, faced removal as adults. So what else can the person do? Well, I mean, before removal is, is executed, the person could ask nicely for what's called a temporary residence permit. Well, that permit is entirely discretionary and it also making the application doesn't forestall removal. And I can point out that in, in some cases, for example, if a serious criminality is, is, is or, or sorry, organized criminality is found, that mechanism um, can only be exercised by um, the assistant deputy minister. So there's very few people can actually exercise that authority. So in practical terms, it takes a very long time. Um, uh, Canada, uh, the person might uh, submit a pre-removal risk assessment, which Canada pointed out. But how does the pre-removal risk assessment help if the concerns are concerns that are not about risk in the country of return? If the concerns are concerns about separation from family, best interests of that person's children in Canada, uh, concerns about perhaps not being able to get access to health care in the country of return. There are, is a, this is a very, very limited jurisdiction to essentially give the person a kind of refugee protection, a kind of asylum protection 
on the basis of risks alleged, risks that the person would, would see in the country of return. So in my case, the hypothetical I gave you, the person with the six months drug offense, the pre-removal risk assessment does very little, nor does going to federal court and, and uh, trying to judicially review a negative pre-removal risk assessment. The, the judge is gonna say this, uh, the, this uh, assessment was exercised in a fair way and in accordance with the law, but the law is so narrow that there is no ability to actually consider the personal circumstances and the person's long tenure in Canada. There, there's no ability to consider their level of dangerousness. There's no ability to consider their remorse, how they've improved themselves. Any of those personal equitable factors are not considered in the pre-removal risk assessment. So what else can our hypothetical person do? They could perhaps ask for a deferral of removal, but, but, but for how long? Uh, as Canada rightly pointed out, it's a question of when, not if. So perhaps the deferrals officer will defer if the person has an upcoming medical scan for a few months, but they're not gonna refer, def, defer in the case of Mr. Cooner or Mr. Ravel, they're not gonna defer for a year, two years, five years. That, w when that removals officer has a removal order in hand, that officer has a mandate to execute it. I, I recognize that I've taken up a long time, but um, I, 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 and just I would, in closing, I wanna say that there is very little in the specific case, that we have many procedures, many possible procedures, but there's little availability of those procedures in cases where you have serious criminality and there's a greater than six month in sentence imposed. And certainly there are no procedures that forestall the removal of the person unless they can demonstrate risk in the country of removal. That is the core point we wanna hammer home and that's why we think the Canada scheme is, is defective. Um, I, take, I believe I have about four more minutes. Um, so I just want to uh, clarify a point um, because Canada raised it at the investigative stage. So Canada mentioned that um, there's the ability of an officer to uh, do an investigative report and determine whether they think an individual is inadmissible. And, there's the, and then that report has to be assessed by a different officer uh, to be determined whether it's well-founded. Um, the Court of Appeal has recently reaffirmed um, that that stage, there is no obligation to consider personal considerations. There is no obligation upon the, it's essentially a prosecutorial discretion. There is no ability, there's no requirement for the officer to say, well, I think this person's been here for 40 years. That should be taken into consideration. There's no ability for the officer to say, well, I think this person has really turned themselves around based upon the evidence before me. So my friend points out that there's the ability to give submissions to the officer. There's the ability, to, uh, the, the officer has to um, consider those submissions, but what does the officer to do with those submissions? When we have the Court of Appeals saying, there is no requirement to do a humanitarian assessment. There's no requirement to do uh, a discretionary assessment at that stage, at this prosecutorial discretion stage. We might hope that an officer just decides not to write up the person or refer them, but there's no legal requirement there. And so our concern is the mechanical operation of the law and, and, and that this prosecutorial discretion stage is not a real, especially considering what the Court of Appeals recently told us, it's not a real and effective remedy for a long-term person permanent residence facing deportation after decades in the country. So with that, I would, Thank you your time and, um, and subject to any more questions, um, we will be providing further written submissions to, to, to clarify our position further. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eso es muy importante. Le damos la palabra a la representación del Estado. As I noted at the beginning, I'm not a legal expert, so I can't really directly respond to your questions. We've taken note and we will uh, seek to provide you written um, answers. Uh, if you would like, though, I could reread the sections that refer to the, the issue of the child. Uh, 
uh, and or the RRP, um, but it's as, as you wish. It, uh, you'll be getting the text anyway. So. Sí, gracias. Eh, ¿Algún punto de, de, de interés eh, sobre, eh, porque los tres preguntamos con el tema de la unidad familiar, eh, pero igual la preparación de sus respuestas por escrito también eh, son, son importantes, pero puede, puede well, usar. Perhaps just of appreciation for your, your thoughtfulness. Uh, I just highlight a couple of the things that were mentioned in this text and we'll come back with fuller examples from experts <laughs> in terms of your question. Uh, on the humanitarian and compassionate grounds to consider uh, an inadmissible case, the request for such uh, uh, an exemption uh, is, uh, can be initiated by the applicant or by the minister or his representatives or her representatives. And that uh, humanitarian and compassionate grounds includes, gives the authority uh, for the minister or his representatives um, to grant an exemption to the status uh, justified by humanitarian and, and just uh, compassionate considerations, uh, taking into account the best interest of children directly affected. So family members or nieces or whomever it might be directly affected by the removal. Also, um, in terms of deferring a removal of an inadmissible person, uh, examples include um, that they can be done uh, based on the interest of the children. Uh, so just to give you two examples where minimally children can be taken into consideration in terms of uh, inadmissibility uh, or deferring inadmissibility. Thank you for your time. Eh, vamos a dar por terminada la audiencia eh, agradeciéndole a ambas partes colocar este tema de un gran interés. El tema hoy, el tema migratorio en, para nuestra región es un tema eh, de, de primer orden, tiene una trascendencia por eh, la especial situación y circunstancias En, la, en, los que, en las que se está dando en toda la región el, el, el tema migratorio. Eh, hoy, con un caso muy específico y particular que identifica ya no esa persona que llegó eh, y está como adaptándose a la vida, sino ese, eh, 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 recordando los casos, llegan a un país a los 7, a los 10 años, es se ha hecho la vida en ese, en ese país. Entonces, tener esta posibilidad de, 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 de escucharles, nos gustaría muy particularmente eh, eh, tener esta información de la relación que ustedes hacen, cada, cada uno de las partes, de las formas como eh, este, este derecho a tener una protección especial por su condición de persona residente de, eh, de, larga, de larga data, eh, en las condiciones, así, así están los principios reconocidos, los principios sobre movilidad humana y las garantías que se tienen para el reclamo fundamental de los derechos, de los derechos básicos. Muchísimas gracias, esperamos sus consideraciones por escrito y... En, el, en la comisión el tema tiene una relevancia e importancia para su continuidad en seguimiento. Muchas gracias y esta audiencia ha concluido.